Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. As you can see by the Macintoshes on the bench, this is the Macintosh Mini Repairathon. Actually, we're in part two here. If you haven't seen part one, I recommend you watch that first. In part one, I took the Macintosh SE, I touched up some of the solder joints on the inside, cleaned it up a little bit, put it back together, and we gave it a good test, and it absolutely works perfectly. As you can see here, it's still booted up into the Macintosh OS System 6. Next, I opened up the Macintosh Classic, and currently the back is off this machine. The motherboard was wedged in there pretty rudely. It turns out the motherboard has some leaky caps, but the power supply itself seems okay. With a quick power on, the computer has no audio, but it did start to boot up. I didn't actually plug a SCSI device into it, but we actually had the flashing question mark. So things are looking good there. It just needs a good clean and a recap. So in this video, I wanna finish doing that recap on the Macintosh Classic, and then I wanna break into the Macintosh Classic 2, which we haven't even looked inside of or tested, and hopefully we'll get that machine working as well. And at the end of this video, I hope to have three working classic Macintoshes. So without further ado, let's get right to it. As I mentioned in the intro, we're going to be focusing our attention on the Macintosh Classic here. So let me get these other two machines off the bench so we can give all our attention to this little thing. Now, in case you're coming here looking on how to do a repair for a Macintosh Classic, this machine does mostly work and really just needs a recap on the motherboard. First thing you want to do after opening it up is definitely pull the neck board off there because you don't want to accidentally bump it while unplugging one of these cables from the motherboard and snap the neck off your CRT which would mean you have to buy a whole new CRT. Not easy in this day and age. So there are two common faults on this motherboard. There are the leaky electrolytic caps on the motherboard, which 100% of these motherboards, if they haven't already been recapped, are going to need to be recapped. Even if the machine turns on and seems to work okay, those caps are gonna be leaking. So you definitely need to sort that out because the longer you leave those caps on there, the more damage is gonna to occur to the motherboard. The other fault that happens with these machines are caps that leak on the power supply board. Now there are two large high voltage caps right here. It's not those that leak. It's usually the low voltage ones that leak and they're in this corner back there. There are brown Nichicon caps in the case of this power supply. And I've had multiple of these boards where those leak. And when they do leak, you get some brown gunk that kind of appears along the bottom edge here and it's sticky and smelly. And that's the electrolyte coming out of those capacitors. This board shows no signs of leakage, and when we turned this thing on in part one, the machine did power up and work seemingly normally. But what I wanna do in this video is, after we recap the motherboard, I wanna pull the power supply board out, and we're gonna actually remove a couple of those caps and just take a look at the underside. If they're starting to leak, we'll actually see that when we pull the caps out. And if they look good, I'll probably just stick them right back in. Obviously, if you're going through all the effort to pull this board out, you could just recap it, but whether that's necessary or not, I couldn't say for sure, but I have had multiple of these where those caps have leaked and therefore maybe it's a good idea to actually recap these, at least those caps there, because it's a known issue with these boards. Now this particular Mac Classic did come with this RAM expansion board that plugs into this slot right here. I'm not 100% sure if all Mac Classics came with this board or not, but if it's missing, you're stuck with just one megabyte of memory as the maximum amount of RAM on your Macintosh. When this expansion board is connected to the motherboard, but you don't have any memory in the SIM slots, you get an extra one megabyte of RAM for a total of two. And when you add two additional one megabyte SIMs, like I have installed now, you get a total of four, which is the maximum amount of RAM you can have on these Macintosh Classic boards. That RAM limitation, in case you're wondering, has to do with Apple's design of the original Macintosh. All of these 16-bit, 68,000 base machines seem to have that same RAM limitation, and that's in the glue logic, which is inside this IC on this motherboard that connects the RAM to the CPU. The rest of the memory map, which is 16 megabytes total for this particular processor, is used up by things like the peripheral I.O. and ROMs and things like that. And unfortunately, it's fixed, and there's just no way to go above four megabytes. Lots of other systems that use the 68,000 processor, like the Amiga, can go up to eight megabytes of RAM with the 68,000 based machines. Once you upgrade your computer to a 32-bit processor, like a 68020 or beyond, you can then add a lot more memory. And even on the Macintosh SE 30, which is the successor to just the SE, 
you can go up to 128 megs of RAM on that particular computer. And that again is facilitated by the glue logic that Apple included on that motherboard that allows that large amount of memory. When you look at a system like the Classic 2 though, which we'll be looking at in a little bit, that has a maximum RAM size of only 10 megabytes, which is definitely a lot less than is allowed by the 68030 processor that's on there. But again, it's a limitation of the chipset that's on the motherboard. And the fact is the Classic 2 motherboard is derived from the Macintosh LC motherboard, another kind of crippled Apple motherboard that also has that same 10 megabyte limitation. Anyhow, turning our attention back to the motherboard here, the capacitors that have leaked are, well, all of them, unfortunately. And if I tilt this to the right angle, you can just see all this kind of goop and stuff that's on the board here. And that is all the electrolyte that has leaked out. Luckily, the corrosion seems somewhat minimal. Like if you look around the pins here, doesn't look super bad. Let's look over here in the sound area. Yep, same thing, just kind of a mess from the caps. And these two have leaked as well. And it's all kind of bad. And actually, now that I look at it, it looks like the serial number is actually starting to come off. And that is, I guess, from the leaking electrolyte as well. But look at this. See, you have corrosion down here on those two parts. And the battery, I don't think, was leaking yet, although it might have just started. Over in this area of the motherboard, away from the capacitors, things are looking definitely better. But definitely the caps are starting to corrode and eat away at the motherboard. So this absolutely, positively needs to be cleaned up and those caps need to come off the board. Now, when we powered up this computer, it didn't have any sound at all. There was no bong. And I think it's this cap right here, which has gone open. It's leaked and that's the sound chip. And I'm pretty sure this is in series with the audio output, which I think is right there. And also it makes its way to this connector to go to the analog board where the amplifier is for that speaker. And because this capacitor is just open now, it's no longer passing any AC, which is normally what capacitors do. They don't pass DC, they filter that, but they'll pass AC. Well, because this is open, it's essentially like it's not even installed on the board. And that's why we have no sound. I haven't looked at the schematics, but I have a feeling most of these other 47s are for power rails and things like that. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna take these off the board. I'm gonna be using these exact needle nose right here, and then we'll replace them. Now I'm gonna be pulling these off using the wiggle method. Well, better known as the twist method. Now there's lots of controversy on how you should get caps off motherboards, but these ones are corroded. And if you try to desolder these, there's a very high likelihood that unless you have very specialized tools, you're gonna lift pads off the motherboard. I have found that the wiggle method especially is really good and gentle on the motherboard and doesn't take them off. But there are other methods like the cutting method, there's the desoldering method, and probably a bunch of other ones that you can try to use if you're gonna recap your motherboard. Your mileage may vary on how good those are, but having talked to a lot of people who do this type of work all the time, they do say that for the casual recapper, the wiggle method where you just wiggle this back and forth is really one of the best and safest way to get these caps off the board. I first learned about this method from Ray Carlson, who's got a YouTube channel where he's like an expert restorer of electronics, going back all the way to the vintage stuff with the vacuum tubes. So when I look at someone who is a real expert and also makes a ton of videos showing his expertise, I really trust that his method is a good method. And that's how I started doing this method. There surely will be a lot of comments down below about how, well, I ruined this motherboard or I nearly ruined this motherboard by doing this method and yada, yada, yada. You know, people are gonna get upset and that's just how it goes with these types of videos. But I'm gonna do my wiggle method and I'm gonna show it and then we'll get some new caps onto this board. So as I mentioned, wiggle method, I have these bent needle nose, which I actually really love for this exact use. And let's just zoom in on this really messed up corroded area here. And what I like to do is I grab one of these, I'm squeezing and I'm pushing down towards the board and you just start to wiggle the cap. And what you're doing is you're weakening the legs. You know, you're causing metal fatigue on the legs and the cap, it just breaks off the board. It left its legs behind on the pads there, which is exactly what we want. But as you can see, this leaky gross cap here is completely removed from the board and look at that gunk on the bottom, gross. So the whole idea is you're just gonna do the same thing on all the caps on the board and they should all come off relatively easily. There we go. Sometimes the little black thing on the bottom is just uh, breaks apart, which is completely normal. I just noticed this, did I just do that? That got pushed way over. That's the clock crystal there for the real time clock, 32 kilohertz. Let's do wiggle on this cap up here. 
So again, I'm pushing down and we're just wiggling and then we don't wanna pull up. You just wanna do that until it breaks free like that. Now, normally I'd recommend taking a picture of the board first so you know exactly where all the caps go. For something like this board, which is very common, there's lots of photos online. Also, I noticed every single cap is 47 microfarad except for this little one microfarad cap. So I don't really need to worry about it. This cap is posing a little more difficulty, by the way. It is refusing to come off with the wiggle method. Sometimes the small ones can pose an issue. But I found if that is the problem, then sometimes just twisting it a little further can help the situation. Again, I'm pushing down. Oh, there we go, it came off. I was pushing down and twisting, and there it is. All right, I'm just gonna keep going with this method here, and I will stop talking, and I will come back if anything bad happens. All right, there we go, the final cap just came off. Let's see if this left a leg behind. Yep, sometimes it leaves a little bit of a leg behind there. And what I do is you just sort of use your finger to bend it back and forth until it comes off. None of the pads got lifted or ripped. Everything looks good. There's a whole lot of gunk under there. Over here as well, it looks really bad. I just put a paper towel underneath the motherboard. Now what's happening here is the electrolyte has made its way all over here, like under these chips and whatnot. And I found that if I just wash the board with soap and water, what's, what happens is this electrolyte kind of turns into this salt. I don't know the right name for it, but it looks like salt. It's white and crusty and it'll be all around the legs. So someone mentioned to try to avoid that, to use some vinegar and pre-soak it and maybe scrub it a little bit as well. So in here, I just have regular vinegar, white vinegar, the stuff you could buy at the supermarket. And I'm just gonna pour this on the motherboard and I'm going to really soak it in there. And I'm gonna do it over here as well. In all the areas where there was leakage, there we go. And I'm just gonna grab myself a brush here and I'm really gonna to start to kind of work this in. Now, I don't know for sure if this is going to, I don't know, eat away at this salt corrosion that's all over the board. What's that bubbling that's happening? Is that just coming from the brushes or is that actually a reaction that's happening? I don't know. But I'm just gonna let this kind of get in here and anywhere I see that the electrolyte has left that like brown residue behind, I'm gonna try to get it, get the bristles in there and make sure that the, the vinegar has a chance to do some, some work there. Definitely seems to be a little bit of a bubbling going on. I don't know if that's from the bristles brushing against the pins, but seems to be bubbling up a little bit, which sort of implies there's something happening here, which is good. Now it goes without saying, if you had something like a sonic cleaner, but I don't think a lot of people are gonna have something that's big enough for an entire motherboard. Perhaps this little Macintosh motherboard would fit in some sonic cleaners. I actually have a large one that would fit this motherboard. It would fit much larger motherboards too, but I don't really wanna use that because I wanna do a repair here that anyone can do and something that is easily repeatable by the regular home person. Sort of like the bubbling is, seems good to me. Like it's a good thing that it's bubbling. Like there's some reaction happening and it's actually eating away at this crap that it left behind on the motherboard. Yeah, I mean, look at that. Now, unfortunately, you might have a motherboard that the corrosion is so bad that you have eaten traces and you have components that have actually fallen off the board. What happens with the corrosion is it can convert the solder that's used to attach these components to this porous, horrible material that's very, A, difficult to work with, and B, just starts to come off the boards. In that case, you're just gonna have to kind of scrape at it to try to expose some fresh solder that's underneath and that you can get your iron onto, use lots of flux, and just try to get that crap off the board. You may need to remove components entirely, like small chips. You might need to try to clean them really well. Unfortunately, this motherboard is not that bad, so there's not gonna be any examples of that type of work, but it definitely can happen. Not to mention, you can often have these traces under here that start to get eaten away as well. The corrosion on this board definitely was on the more mild side, so we don't have any eaten traces. 
but you can see often after you clean these up, when you use a, a magnifying glass, you'll notice that like little traces in underneath there are eaten away. And you wanna make sure that you sort those out first before you attach new components. Because obviously if you attach a new component, well, you're not gonna be able to see that there is an eaten trace underneath there once the new component is soldered back on. So you do need to try to fix all that stuff before you reattach any components. So inspect things with a little magnifying glass. And if necessary, you might be able to use a multimeter to tone out traces that go underneath these components just to validate that they work before you put things on. Look how much it's actually foaming up here when I do this. Yep, that's, that's interesting. Like the more I agitate it, the more it foams up. So it feels like this agitation really is having some kind of an effect. All right, well, I think what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna let this sit. I think I've agitated enough. I'll let this sit for a bit just sort of um, bubble away here or eat away at all this junk. Unfortunately, a lot of the vinegar now is leaking out and onto my paper towel that's underneath the motherboard because there are holes in this motherboard. So you could keep reapplying or you could just sort of leave this as is. And then after this, the next step will be washing. Okay, motherboard has soaked long enough in this vinegar solution. Next step is I'm gonna take this upstairs and I am gonna put this under soap and water and give this a thorough washing. I've talked about this method a bunch of times before, but I simply take the motherboard or whatever I'm washing up to the sink and I use regular soap and water and one of these anti-static brushes just to get in every nook and cranny. Whenever I've used vinegar or anything else that's sort of corrosive, I'll make sure to give it a sniff test after I've done rinsing just to make sure there's nothing left on there. Now, if your city has really hard water, which luckily I do not have here where I live, you might not want to let the water air dry on the motherboard. Even me, I used very high velocity air out of a blower motor to completely dry the motherboard and just get rid of every trace of water. If you're unsure about that, you can always use deionized water for a rinse or even alcohol as a rinse cycle at the end just to flush away any extra water. All right, here's the Mac Classic board, all washed and dried. There's definitely some of that white salt stuff that I was talking about that I was trying to eliminate with the vinegar, but that didn't really, I don't think it actually did anything really. So I'm not sure that vinegar is the right choice for this. I don't know if this is actually corrosive or damaging in any way to the board. It's definitely not conductive. I've had plenty of boards like this where it has this on here and there's no, there's no ill effects, the board works fine. And definitely this white stuff seems to be worse in the areas that had a lot of that electrolyte that was pooled up from the leaking caps, like here around the sound chip. But like I said, it doesn't seem to have any negative effect on the board. And if you have any ideas of how to remove this in a better way, please let me know. But as you can see, we tried vinegar, I did scrubbing and that did not do anything in this case. Anyhow, the next step for the recapping is I need to get all these little legs off of these pads here and clean these pads up so they are nice and fresh and ready to accept new capacitors. To clean up these pads, I'm gonna use three things. The pine sill soldering iron, some fresh solder here, which I have on a little 3D printed holder, and some solder wick. This is what you really need and good quality stuff. I'm using MG chemical stuff here to get the old crap off of these pads because we want them to look nice and fresh for when we install new caps on this board. In addition, I'm gonna be using something like this to clean the tip of the soldering iron because as I get these little uh, pieces off the board, they're gonna be stuck on the tip and you need to get them off. So the method I use to get these off is you just heat up your iron to like 350 degrees and you use some fresh solder and you just try to scratch them off basically. Now it can be a little tricky. I'm just uh, seeing if this is working. Yeah, I think it's good. Yep, that one's good. And you just kind of heat with, you just heat, add a little solder, and then you try to scrape it off. And you can kind of feel when it comes away. Now, yep, there we go. So it's actually on the tip of the iron there. Now it's gonna be hard to see, I know. And it's definitely leaving behind a little bit of a, of a crustiness on the pad, but we'll take care of that in just a moment. So you just go through all of these and you just try to get those little leg remnants right off the board. There we go. And this one, because it's not in too bad of a shape, we're making pretty quick work of it. Now you do notice that the solder is not sticking to all of the pad. There's parts that still have the old crusty solder like over there. And that's because the corrosion has gotten to it. And we're gonna need to try to, to clean that up using the wick and stuff like that. I'm just making sure all of these are smooth. And they are. 
Now these types of pads on these motherboards, they're just glued on. So you don't want to use too much heat or you're going to lift it and potentially rip traces and things like that. So you want to be kind of quick about it. So like I said, 350 degrees, well, I guess 345 is what I'm using. Seems to work well for me, but again, your mileage may vary. Oops, I was doing that off camera. So I'm just working on these ones. And you notice there's all this like black gunk that's coming off. And again, that is the corrosion in effect. We're gonna need to clean that up with some alcohol. We'll do that in a moment. Now, one thing is for sure is there's a real fishy smell. Even though I clean this board really well, the actual remnants here are coated in that electrolyte corrosion. And it's giving me a real yucky fishy smell. Something else you might wanna consider, and I've talked about this in some other videos, is if your motherboard has SIM sockets and they are currently not populated, I really recommend you put tape over them because while you're doing this operation, you could drop a blob of solder into your SIM socket and that will ruin your day. Ask me how I know. <laughs> I know because I've done it and it was miserable. <laughs> If you do drop a blob of solder on there, it's almost unfixable, at least uh, without swapping out the SIM sockets. Okay, so we have the solder wick here, and now I'm gonna try to clean up what we have here and get this crusty crap off the board. And you can see as I move this around, maybe I should zoom in a little bit, it leaves a lot of black crusty junk behind, but unfortunately that's just par for the course. Okay, here's a good example of what I was talking about. Notice this one right here. This one, see all this gunk on there? I'm gonna just use these tweezers and I'm gonna physically scrape that away because I want to, oh, that's not in focus, stay in focus. I want this to be shiny and nice, just like the rest of it. So there we go. See that, it's coming off. Same over here. Just wanna scrape this away. I want the pad to be all a nice shiny color, even the part there that is black and kind of oxidized or corroded looking. Sometimes you might find putting a little bit of 99% IPA just helps you see better. Because as you can see, once the liquid is on there, it gives us better visibility into what's happening on the pad. Now see all this crap here? That'll come off when we try to clean it. But that pad there, I just wanted to make it a little bit more shiny. So we're just trying to scrape that corroded junk off of there. Okay, so those two are okay, but down here, you can't really reveal what's going on until you got the desoldering braid and you've sort of gone over these. So this one is the same. See that black stuff is over here on the right side. And let's do these ones here. And yep, it's uh, looking pretty gross as well. So we're gonna do the same thing, but see all this? Oh, come on, stay in focus. <laughs> it focuses on my hand. So we're gonna try to Okay, there's a little bit of solder residue left behind on there. So we're just gonna try to get that off. There's a bit of alcohol, but that doesn't affect it too badly. Try to get this clean again. Now you'd be surprised. I've worked on some motherboards that were really bad and they came out really nice once I, once I did the scratching to it. I just gotta, I'm gonna have to apply some fresh solder on this one because it's acting up. Okay. Notice there, when I tried to apply fresh solder, it only stuck right there. It didn't even stick on this whole area over there. And that, again, is because there's that crap on there, that corroded solder left behind. That's what we're trying to clean up here by scraping it. Now, this scraping that I'm doing here, you really have to be careful. You don't want to scrape too much because you could actually damage the pad, you could peel it up, you know, you could do stuff. So I try to only scrape on the pad itself and not off the edge and back onto it. You know, I don't want to possibly rip it off the board. Now with this one, you notice there's a little bit of copper exposed there. That's because that was the trace that went from that via onto the pad. It had solder resist on it, but it came off. And that's because the corrosion actually weakened the solder mask. And that is what happens, unfortunately. Now, I didn't mention this early on, but if you get something like cotton buds, that can help you just sort of clean up all that gunk that's left behind, just so you can see a little more clearly what's going on underneath there. See, so this looks a million times better than it did. And if we go up to this area and scratch that off as well. And now these pads over here, they're all nice and clean and they're ready to accept. I'm just gonna clean up a little bit down here. <laughs> they're ready to accept new capacitors. Yes, what an improvement. 
Sometimes I find that the alcohol does help clean up that, that junk that's left behind from the leaking electrolyte. Okay, next up is these caps over here, and I'm just gonna time-lapse this. All right, so check that out. Ward's looking way better now, isn't it? I did uh, clean up around these ICs to try to get that, that white salt stuff off. And now the pads are all looking really shiny and good, and we're ready to attach some new capacitors to this board. For replacing these caps, this particular board uses 47 microfarad. I think the originals were 16 volts, so 16 volts or 25 volts will be totally fine. And it used a one microfarad, and I don't remember what the original voltage value was, but this 50 volt part right here will be fine. Now, unfortunately, I only have one of these in this bag here, so I'm going to be using these caps instead, which are 47 microfarad, 16 volts, but these are ceramic type. Now, these are always a perfect replacement for the caps that were on here, and that's because the capacitance values of these ceramics is very dependent on the voltage, and, and these could end up being something like a 4 microfarad instead of 47, because they're not always going to be run at 16 volts. A bunch of them are going to be run at 5 volts on here. So please keep that in mind when picking replacement parts. I've found these ceramics work really well on these motherboards. It doesn't seem to cause any negative effects, but it could possibly cause an effect, especially if it's used in like a reset circuit or some type of a time-based circuit, the capacitance value is much more important on those. In addition, if I had any like 100 microfarad versions of these, I might use them instead in place of the 47s just because of that voltage dependent problem. But this is all I got, so this is what we're gonna use. The thing I like about these ceramic caps though is they're non-polarized, so you don't have to worry about the polarity when installing these on the board. Luckily, Apple's really good at marking the correct polarity. Some manufacturers like Commodore, mm, sometimes they make mistakes. And if you follow the markings on the motherboard, a couple of caps can be installed wrong. And those are specifically, I think the Amiga 4000 has that problem. So we got our seven caps here for the 47. And I'm just gonna grab one of these one microfarads for the audio circuit here. And what this does tell me is I need to put an order in for DigiKey for more of these caps so that I have more selection available for future recaps. Okay, so the next step is rosin flux. Now I like to use rosin flux. You could use no clean flux as well. What I like to do is take this rosin flux, which I have in this dropper bottle here, and I, I just put a little bit of it in between the two pads. And this just helps me get the cap on a little more easily. If you're not familiar with what flux does, it helps the solder flow across the connections. Now, when we're looking at solder like this, this is actually rosin core. So it has flux built into it, but it only is exposed to the component once you melt the solder. When you have some on the board like this and you pick up one of these capacitors and we just place it right there, then the flux is now stuck on my tweezers, but it's also stuck on the part, holds the part on the board and then as soon as we apply any fresh solder to that, it actually starts to flow around the component, which is perfect. It's exactly what we want. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna apply some fresh solder to the tip of the iron here. And I'm just gonna use tweezers to hold the part down into position. And I'm gonna heat this up. Oops, <laughs> and then it went flying. <laughs> okay, so I've attached one of the sides, not enough solder, but I'll go back and apply more once I have gone through and got these all attached to the board, at least on one side. Oh, the other benefit of these particular types of caps, these ceramic ones, is they don't leak. <laughs> there will be no future leakage of these caps. They can short. Their failure mode is a short as well, very similar to tantalums. But that usually comes from a stress fracture on the uh, part itself and not just over time. Now, some people are OCD about alignment of the components. Personally, I'm not. So I just get them on there so they're on correctly and they're not shorting with anything else that's nearby. So those four caps are now attached just on one side and not with enough solder. So what I like to do is just flip the board around because I'm right-handed. I'm gonna be using my right hand here. And we are just going to apply solder and heat and get the other side nicely attached to the board with a nice little fillet there whatever that's called. And there, as you can see, those are now nicely attached on the other side. So I'm just gonna flip it around and then clean up the inadequate soldering that I did on this side here. 
And there we go. There's a little bit of flux residue on there. That's what the brown stuff is, but those are all nicely attached to the board. All right, and all that's left is this little one microfarad cap here. I'm gonna be using this same type of cap that was on there, a little aluminum radial one or whatever this is called. And my tweezers are way too sticky. So with that flux applied, it's exactly the same thing. You just kind of hold this down into position and you solder one leg on first, as long as the cap is, well, sorry, that was probably out of focus, but it's now attached with one side, not very well, but good enough to hold it in place. Flip the board around. I'm going to hold onto the cap again, and we're going to touch the pad and the leg together like that. Now it's attached on both sides, and I'm just going to use the actual solder here to get more on there. I want to see a little round bead or something like that. That's where it's holding the leg down onto the board. And now with this flipped around, same thing on this side. There we go. The little round thingamajiggy there. <laughs> that holds that cap in place. Incidentally, you see the positive sign there? That is away from the black mark that's on here. That would be the negative side. And you also, it's square on that side. And the little black plastic thing on the bottom of the cap, which I should have shown earlier, has the angled corners as the silkscreen markings are on the board. So that helps you orient that particular part in there. All right, well, now we can uh, try to clean up some of this a little bit if you want. So just use a little IPA and you can use a cotton bud or something like this to try to get some of that flux off. I mean, it's completely optional. Flux is not corrosive. It's not bad for the board. It's just a bit unsightly. So clean it up optionally if you want. To be honest, half the time, I don't even bother. Make sure also while you're cleaning up that you didn't bridge any vias nearby together with some extra solder. So you just want to double check that everything looks good. I think things are looking pretty good on the board though, in that area at least. And over here, I see a little bit of fluff on there. <laughs> so we'll do the same thing. Just clean this up just a little bit. Incidentally, the other type of cap you could use when redoing these boards are tantalums. And that's one right there, this black one. Why didn't Apple use these all around? Who knows? These types of caps over here are just cheaper. So I'm assuming this was a cost cutting measure. I don't know. Some of the early Mac 2 CIs and the Macintosh 2 boards were entirely tantalums and they were very expensive computers. So I'm assuming, yeah, it was just purely cost cutting. If they had used those, there's a good chance that there would be no damage to any of these boards. And all we might have is some shorted caps here or there, which is no big deal. So there we have it. That is one recapped Macintosh classic motherboard. You might want to check on the backside, make sure there's no corrosion or anything that's on here. Sometimes you can get blue fluffy stuff from the electrolytes that have leaked from these leaky caps, but nope, nothing here. And you might want to double check that you have the polarity correct on all your caps if you are using polarized caps. Of course, in our case, we're only using this one here and I know that one's on correct. And the rest of these, it doesn't matter because they are not polarized. So this thing is done. Okay, so the analog board or the power supply board here has the same exact little plastic clips as it was on the Mac SE. Thing is, we need to work on this area down here, which is gonna be difficult for me to get my hand in there to try to pull those caps out and put them back in. So I think we're gonna pop this whole board out of the case. And I wanna see if we could do it without actually unplugging the high voltage anode cap. So if you're doing this, you can just skip over touching this whole high voltage part and then, uh, well, feel a little bit more safe about things. For removing this from the case, it looks like there is just this single screw right here. Does this thing come out? Nope, because there's another screw right there. <laughs> it was sort of hidden behind the metal chassis. I couldn't see that. All right, now I think this thing is totally free. It is indeed. And as you can see, this kind of pulls away and I'm doing this in a way that leaving all the cables connected except for the, the neck here because we don't want to potentially break that. So you just leave that off and then you can kind of just pull this thing out of the way. Let's get these little clips out of here so I can peel this plastic back. And this is where this little bent pick comes in very handy because that allows us to get these out relatively easily. Okay, that was the with speaker one, so it's we're getting there. Okay, so all the ones over here are off, so that lets us peel this back entirely. And take a look at this. That right there is electrolyte coming out of the caps. That is not flux residue. 
That right there is leaking caps. There's also some right here. Somehow it like makes its way through the board. There's some over there. So yeah, this is a leaky cap area. I didn't think it was, but it absolutely is. So what I find very interesting is, as I mentioned, these are good name brand caps, but I have power supplies that have never been used. Like they are new old stock Apple repair parts. I took them out of their bag. They were sealed in there and they're leaky. So it seems like by the early 90s or like the mid 90s when these power supplies were made, those caps had turned to junk. I have never opened up a Mac SE and seen leaking caps like this, but in Mac Classics, it's just par for the course and it seems super common. Now, I hooked up my vice grip again to this plastic piece to hold it out of the way so I don't have to take those last two clips out. Now you can get these out just using desoldering braid just like that, but I'm gonna use my desoldering arm because I have that thing and it makes this process a lot easier. But if you don't have one, all you need to do is hold onto those caps one by one and you either just heat up the legs pull them out of the board. You might want to use this braid to kind of clean it up and then you can just pull them straight out. All right, I've removed all the caps. You can see down here, it's quite a mess. There's a bunch of leaking electrolyte there. Now, when it comes to the rest of the caps on the board here, like see these blue ones and the black one there, those are fine. The only ones that are a problem are the brown ones that were in that area. And those are on like the five and the 12 volt rails on the output of the power supply. Let's unplug this thing here just to make a little more visibility into it. But you see all that leaking there? Yeah, no good. But this stuff down here, these are fine. It's just these caps that are the problem. Now looking at these caps, you can see it's a leaky mess. Now it might be these two and that one over there with the black plug. These might be actually okay, maybe. It's really hard to tell because everything's all wet. I have a feeling it's these caps here, SXF. That's like the series number. Let's look at this one here. So this Nichicon cap here is of a different type. PL, I think, I wish it were in focus. There it is, PL. So maybe these ones are fine actually. It doesn't look fine though, does it? No, I'm gonna say that that one's leaking as well. And then this one is definitely a gusher. <laughs> definitely a gusher here and yep. Yeah, S X E. Okay. So there was another one here that I dropped. I think it was S X E. Oh, there's two down in here actually. Okay. So this one down here is one of those P L M ones that I'm not positive if this is actually leaking. And then there's another little one down in here that kind of fell out while I was desoldering. And it's uh, it's one of the rubber plugs one. Now this is also a P L M model. They're all looking pretty bad. And you know what? Now that these are out of here, it smells it smells really fishy and horrible. Ugh. So what needs to happen now is the board on this side here needs to be cleaned up of all that leaking electrolyte. Now, one of the issues is this can leak and get onto the voltage regulator, which if I try to move these wires out of the way, it's this I see right here. And when electrolyte gets on there, this is a kind of a high precision part. You start to get weird voltage outputs from your power supply. So we really need to spray a whole lot of alcohol in this area here and just flush this out of all of this crap. Now you have to be careful, this speaker's riveted on here and you know, put too much alcohol in the area, it could damage it. And plus there's the transformer there for the flyback switch mode power supply. So what I'm gonna do is just grab some paper towels here and I'm going to fold this up and just stick that there like so. In fact, you know, we can unplug this cable here. This is the flyback, or sorry, this is the deflection yoke here, and that should give us a little bit better visibility. There we go. So I have my 100% IPA, it's in a spray bottle. Well, it wasn't originally, but I just, um, I just put a spray nozzle on it, and then we're just gonna start soaking the area here. Try to clean up all that crap that leaked all over the board. You wanna make sure to clean the area around that IC right there though, just to kind of flush that out. And wow, you can just see how much crap is on the board right there. Look at this, what a mess. Grabbing some of these cotton swabs can help just to kind of sop up the, the grossness. Look at that, yuck. So while personally, I'm not a big fan of just like blanket recapping boards, I'm also a fan of changing caps out that are known to leak. And on Mac Classics, these ones right here, these brown caps I took off, they are problems. They're always problems. Now what I'm also doing is wiping the edge of the board here and getting all that stuff off there that was uh, 
visible on the backside or when we lifted up that plastic shield. And just looking down here, things looking pretty good. This thing didn't have a whole lot of leakage. So I don't see a whole ton of stuff around the IC chip there, the voltage regulator. But I've had plenty of these boards that when the, the crap is on there, it's kind of slightly conductive. And then what happens is the machine won't regulate and you end up with like four volts on the five volt rail and sort of weird things happening. Look at this mess down here. <laughs> I guess my paper towel wasn't really in the right spot to catch all that junk. I just realized one thing I did not do is I did not pay attention to where these caps were on the board. Sorry, that's a bit out of focus. You really want to make a little map first of the polarity and how those are installed. Luckily for me, I have another one of these power supply boards handy. I'm just gonna go look at it and I'm just gonna copy the values that I get from that board so we can repopulate this board. I don't have these exact caps. I'm pretty sure I don't have these exact caps with the sizes and this, the skinny versions of these, but I'll figure out something to make this work. All right, so this is my other board that I just grabbed. Now this thing's had like physical damage. You can see there's like a bunch of parts removed from it because uh, yeah, things, uh, wow, well, this thing got smashed. But these are the original caps. And interesting is they're not leaky, but I was just looking at them and I can kind of see why. They're Nichicons again, but they're different series. The ones that leaked that were SFX series are LXF and that's LXF, that's X. SXF. Okay, so it's got one of the potentially leaky ones. So while the caps that are on this board, the values are the same, but seemingly they're slightly of a different series. So I have a feeling that this board is older and maybe the caps they use were better quality. Maybe these ones changed to a different manufacturing plant and that's what happened. But I don't know. I just, like I said, I've had some of these classic boards, the caps don't ever leak and I have other ones where it's like guaranteed that they leak. Anyhow, at least with this board, I can now see the values of things and which direction the polarity is on them. So I'm gonna go look for replacements of these and just see what I have in stock. And then we'll, uh, we'll reinstall some parts onto this board. Okay, so going through my stock, I have these two caps, a good replacement for those. I have a good replacement for these, these two, so those two, but I'm missing these two. I'm just gonna steal them off this board and we're just gonna reuse these old caps. I know that's not ideal, because I don't want to put like potentially leaky caps onto this board. But hey, this thing hasn't leaked and I don't think it will because they're slightly different caps. And at least these other two are good name brand replacements. Now we might find that when we go to remove these that they're leaky as well. In that case, I'm going to go dig through my parts to find something else <laughs> to put in place of these caps. So this one here I need to change first. It's 470 at something volts. Um, the negative rail faces towards this bar here. Okay, so with this one, good, not leaking. That is in okay shape, excellent. Okay, so the 470 is installed. That was this leaky one over here, so we'll throw that over there. This one is the 2200 at 16 volts, which is this cap right here. And luckily this is one of those LXF ones, which hopefully won't be a leaky one. Again, the negative rail faces towards this bar here. And if you go to desolder these, it's actually good if you do it upside down because they can just fall out of the board, which is handy, like that one just did. See, just fell right out. As far as this cap, I would get the camera to focus. It's not leaking either. LXF cap for the win. Okay, what's happening now, and I'm just turning this around here, is that the corrosion that's on here is just making resoldering that cap. That's the one there I was trying to put in really difficult. So even though lots of alcohol went in this area, that's what this white stuff is, I'm going to use my tweezers again to do the same thing I did on the motherboard and just scratch up the where the, the solder goes just to help it adhere a little bit. So let's see if that helped a little bit here. Yep, it did. Notice that it now is actually adhered to the board properly. So that's good. What about this side? Yeah, that side is better too. All right, so I'm gonna stop the camera because it's just about reinstalling the new caps into this board and using the other board as a reference. All right, the caps are reinstalled. It's not the prettiest thing in the world, but you know what? This should work without issue. Now you might have worse corrosion than this board has. This thing is pretty minor to be honest. If you start to see traces that are eaten away, you need to scratch them away and then add some wires to reinforce that. But this looks okay. I don't see anything that's pretty much missing. And we know that this power supply is working because we actually had it powered up briefly and it did work. But those leaky caps, they're absolutely, would have been a problem in short order if we didn't change them out. 
Now I just noticed that this cap right here is an SXF version, 50 volt, 220 microfarad. So I don't really trust that because it's the same exact series as all the ones that did leak. So I think I'm just gonna proactively swap it out. And looking around the rest, they're all blue. Those are probably fine. So it's just that brown one that I don't trust as far as I can throw it. I'm just gonna steal the cap off this board because I don't have it handy. And the way I just got that out of the board is I heated up one leg, bent that over, and then heated up the other leg and it came out. Uh, I should have paid attention to how it's installed. Oh, it's still installed in the other board. So I can look at that. And is this one leaking? Hmm, no. It looks fine, but this is also an XXE cap, which is one of the kind of cruddy ones. Let me see if I have another cap I could use instead of this. I just noticed I have these sort of no-name caps here. 470 at 50, that would have been one of the ones I, I stole off the other dead board to put on this one. So I could have used these, but at least I put name brand caps on, although didn't feel good about putting those potentially junk caps on this board. All right, so the one I took off is 50 volts, 220. And look at this, 220, 50 volts, Sanyo brand. Talk about a smaller package. Uh, we'll use this. Don't know where I got this one, but clearly it was never installed in a board. Alrighty, I installed that Sanyo cap right there on the board. These are the two that came out of, well, one out of this board, one out of the other board, and neither are leaking. And even though these are the SXE caps, both of them, neither are actually leaking. So I don't know, maybe none of the ones with the black plugs here are actually leaking. The ones like this, well, that sure does look like it's leaking. But perhaps the ones that actually leaked are these ones that have that PCB looking plug as opposed to the black rubber one. I think that might actually be the case because if you look at the legs on the one on the left, you can see the legs are corroded, but the ones with the black plug there, not corroded. While I was in there, I did swap out this cap as well. That's that 470 at 50 volts. That was the one I took from the other board. I ended up putting the uh, that no-name one I had in stock in the board. So now there's only one old cap in here. It's this one right here. That's one I took off the other board, but was not leaking and was of a different series than the one that was originally on this board. So I think it should be fine. Whoa, everything's falling apart. All right, so I think this board is ready to go back together. I think I've sufficiently cleaned it. So I'm just gonna reassemble everything here. Make sure you get the fan reconnected and all these connectors and the little plugs and you know, all that stuff. All right, the power supply board is back in. Now I just need to find what I did with the motherboard. Here it is, it was on the floor. This thing is, yep, all ready to go. Now, of course I did not test the disk drive or service it. It's exactly the same thing as the Mac SE. I'm just not gonna bother in this particular video because of course I have a separate video about it. I am only gonna be using this, the Blue Scuzzy for testing because this thing rocks and it's far easier than trying to boot disks on these things. All right, so the power supply analog board connection to the motherboard is reconnected. I am gonna plug this in the floppy drive cable. Let's get the neck board back on here like so. I didn't unplug anything else on here. Well, except for a few things on the analog board, but I put those back on when I plugged this back on and screwed it back in. Here's the RAM card, which I have installed the memory. The jumper here says SIM installed or SIM not installed. Well, SIMs are installed now. So I'm, I moved that to the correct position. This just slides into this slot right here and down into the motherboard like so. And before I plug in the blue SCSI, I am going to check the voltages with the multimeter here once we power this on, because now that we've recapped it, I don't think that's gonna cause anything, but the fact is that electrolyte was all leaky all over the board, and it might cause the voltages to be a little bit high or low. Now there is a potentiometer. It's hard to get to, it's kind of under there to adjust those voltage rails, but there is an adjustment. So first we are gonna start with the five volt rail. We make sure this is turned off and it is. We plug this in like so, and here we go. In fact, I'm just gonna change the range on this so it doesn't have to auto range. There we go, it just it's much quicker at displaying the voltage. Here we go. Wow, we have no sound. <laughs> Do we have a non-working system? At least the voltages look good. Okay, it's got an unhappy Mac on the screen. So it did power up but it went run to, right to unhappy Mac. Let's pull, let's pull the RAM card out of here and I'll try that again. Okay, we have a good sound there. So that's a good five volts, so that's excellent. Let's switch this over to the 12 volt rail. Let's we'll make sure that that looks good. 11.95, so excellent. Our voltages are working well. 
And let's take a look at what this looks like on the front now, just like before. It's a little squished, but the image is stable. It's working and it all looks really good. Now, I wonder what's going on with this. Now, the RAM I installed in here, I didn't even test. I just popped it on here. So I'm gonna take that off. I'll turn this machine off first and I'll find some other memory that is tested. Now, just like on the Mac SE, these are super, super fragile SIM slots. So I'm just using a tool so I don't overextend the little clip. There we go, get those out of there. We have 80 nanosecond Oki Data SIMs installed now. SIM not installed, yes, SIM installed. The jumper is in the right spot, I think. I am just gonna put the memory card into the machine. All right, memory card is installed. Let's turn this back on. Wow, unhappy Mac again. I'm pretty sure that's what's going on here. Yeah. So it says all zeros and a five, and then the next line is 00080000. That's unusual. Let's turn this off. And yep, the computer works fine without it. Let's get these modules off of here. Okay, so how about with no SIMs installed? There's no corrosion of any kind on this board. It doesn't have any uh, caps, it just has a tantalum here, which did not leak. Okay, that's back in. No, oh, unhappy Mac right away again. Fascinating. I have not run into this particular problem before. Okay, and I just changed it over to the other jumper setting, SIM installed, when we don't have any SIMs installed. And we're getting all this. Now, I think this is happening because it might be trying to use the upper part of the memory where the SIMs are not installed for video memory. So this is happening because the data line is floating because the memory is not even installed on the board at all. So if we pull this board out, it will work fine again. That's just, yeah, there we go. So there are two possible problems using this RAM card on this Mac. Either the motherboard is at fault or the card. Well, it's an interesting problem. So I think the best thing to do is try a different card. So I went into my stock here and I found, well, another one of these cards. Let's see how this one works in here. First, we're gonna try this card with no extra RAM installed. Let's see what this does. Aha, so we do have a fault on the motherboard. Well, that's interesting, very interesting. We have the exact same error code on the screen as well. Well, well, things just suddenly got kind of interesting. Since we have two cards that aren't working, we know for sure it's the motherboard. So let's get that thing out of there and start inspecting for broken traces. But actually, before we dive into the deep troubleshooting on the Mac Classic motherboard, something I didn't even think we were gonna have to do, let's take a look at this. This is the Macintosh Classic 2, whoa, <laughs> all unstable. Let's open this up, take a look inside, and then power this on and see if this thing is working. Because honestly, I thought I was gonna be done with both of these machines in this video. And uh, well, the Classic threw a curveball, and who knows what we're gonna find inside this thing. So let's take a quick look at this. Ah, the Macintosh Classic 2. As I mentioned earlier, this thing is derived from the LC, the Macintosh LC, low cost. That was one of Apple's best-selling machines, at least at that time, because the original Macintosh 2 line, the Color Macs, were so expensive. So when the LC came out, people were excited that they could buy a color machine that was really cheap. But it was very hobbled. It had a lot of performance implications. And when you looked at the specs and saw that it had a 68020 at 16 megahertz, you thought, sweet, this is gonna be a fast machine. But no, because Apple didn't want the LC to cut into the market of the faster Macintosh machines, which were on the market at the same time, they gave that 32-bit processor a 16-bit data bus, which slowed it down dramatically. They also gave it like a really funky low resolution color display. And when the Macintosh Classic 2 was designed, they took that weird crippled motherboard from the LC, which has 10 megabytes of RAM limit, which is wild for a 32-bit processor, and they shoehorned that into this, taking out the color display capabilities and the expandability, because it did have an expansion slot on the LC, and shoving it into this thing with the same exact limitations. They actually even improved the processor to a 68030, but with that same 16 megahertz data bus and 10 megabyte memory limit, well, it's pretty much a letdown compared to the SE30. And this machine was supposed to replace the SE30. It was much cheaper, 
but it runs maybe 30% slower than the SE30 at the same clock speed. The SE30 can go up to 128 megs of RAM. It includes a built-in flat floating point unit, so a math coprocessor, and it has an expansion slot. All stuff that this thing does not have. It is possible technically to add an FPU, a floating point unit to this, but I think it's pointless. It doesn't really do anything, except for maybe the odd app that actually uses it. Uh, let's take a look at this thing. It's really just a classic one case. As I mentioned, this case, um, wow, this is weird. Oh, this is like some kind of sticky adhesive thing. Must have had a copy stand on it. As I mentioned, the Classic 2 and the Classic 1 share the same case. Later Classic 2s have holes right here to allow the speaker audio to come through the case a little bit. For whatever reason, this one doesn't have it. It does say Classic 2 here on the back. The serial number sticker is mostly worn off. And then the one add-on that this thing has over the Classic is the audio input right here. Classic just has a, a solid piece of plastic right there. And this has audio input. So if you're gonna put a Classic 2 motherboard into a Classic, the only thing you have to do is desolder this audio input jack from the board, because if you try to put the case on when that's still installed, it just won't work. You could also just drill a hole in the back case of the Mac Classic and then have access to that port. But I actually have one of these stealth Classic 2s, I like to call them, and I did just desolder that jack. I just zip tied it inside the case. So if I ever want to revert back to having that, I could do so. Now, as for disassembly, it appears this case does not have screws there. How about on the top here? Nope. And that one's not installed either. So none of the screws are installed. Oh, by the way, look at this. <laughs> look at this. So there must have been something written on here and someone didn't want that. So they sharpened it away and then a sticker with non-yellowing. Anyhow, the way I like to get this case off is, uh, you know, if you just try, it doesn't really come off. So I, I use the violence method. There we go. Okay, on first appearance, you can notice by the amount of soot that's on everything in here. It's dusty, but it's also really sooty. This thing's been used a lot more than that classic or the SE before that. So it's a good chance that this thing is kind of worn out. First thing we need to do, of course, is get the neck board off and let's pull these cables off the motherboard here and we can take a look. Right off the bat, battery has not leaked. Isn't that excellent? That is absolutely excellent. So this machine supports a total of 10 megs of RAM. It has four megabytes on the motherboard, which is right here. And then you can add an additional two four megabyte SIMs here for that total of 10. There's our 68030 processor, it's clocked at 16 megahertz. We have a bunch of ROMs there, SCSI, floppy. It's pretty much the same as the regular classic. And look right there, you can see the cap juice has leaked all over and turned it all gooey. <laughs> it doesn't look totally horrible, but it doesn't look great either. Now for the power supply board, there's actually two different versions of it. There's a later like cost reduced version that's even further cost reduced that was primarily found on the Classic 2s. And this is not one of them. This appears to be the identical board that we just worked on. I'm gonna assume that it's gonna have the same leakage that we had on the last board. All right, and peeling back the plastic here. Yep, we have corrosion on here as well. So this has leaked in exactly the same way as that other one. And looking down onto the board, it's the same exact terrible caps from Nichicon, and it looks really gooey and gross all around there. Now, what I wanna do now though, is actually just put the motherboard back in and let's power this thing up and see if this thing shows any signs of life. I do notice that whoever took the hard drive out of this at least put the hard drive bracket back in, unlike on the classic. That's a positive. Just for curiosity, this battery has minus 0 0.02 volts in it. Wow, negative voltage, just like the other one. All right, the mains are connected. Let's see if this thing powers up. We're not gonna have any sound, I guarantee that, but let's see if we at least get the flashing question mark. No, it was making a terrible noise. <laughs> Uh, like out of the power supply. <laughs> so yeah, I think the power supply is not working and I'm sure it's because of all that electrolyte and whatever that's on it, but all is not lost. It's not like we're dead in the water and unable to test this motherboard because all I need to do is just take this motherboard out and then put it into the Macintosh Classic. So here is the Classic with the motherboard that doesn't work properly. I mean, it works, but it's just not with the extra RAM. So in goes the Classic 2 motherboard, bad caps and all. Let's just plug in this 
plug in the cables. I'll even plug in the floppy drive. Why not? Okay, power is plugged in. Here we go. All right, no sound. That's as expected. Hopefully, we're going to at least get something on screen. It may not work. Plenty of these machines, when the caps are bad, you get, well, you get nothing. <laughs> All right. So, yes, even though we have a working power supply, the motherboard is unhappy. Well, I was hopeful we'd have validation that this Classic 2 motherboard was functional. So before I go ahead and recap it, I know that we were going to have a working motherboard. But I suppose in the case of the Classic, we recapped it and didn't get a working motherboard. We got a mostly working motherboard. And in the case of this one, it's a mystery. And on that bombshell, I'm going to have to end this video here. As I suspected at the beginning of this series, the Macintosh Classics are living up to their reputation of being unreliable. And it all boils down to the capacitors on the motherboards and the power supplies. Now, this one hopefully is going to work after we recap it. I don't see serious corrosion on here, which means that it should hopefully work. I mean, we're not having any signs of life now, so that's not great. But I've had plenty of motherboards that didn't work at all. And then after I recapped them, they did fully work normally. On the other hand, this motherboard, the classic motherboard, has now been expertly recapped, <laughs> expertly, <laughs> by me. It looks really clean. I mean, look at this thing. It looks brand new now, all fresh caps. And yet, we're still having the problem with that RAM card. So that's what we're going to dig into in part three to try to figure this out. And also, probably between now and part three, I'm just going to recap the Classic 2 off-camera. I'll fix the power supply, and then I'll replace the caps on this. I think I'm gonna have to order some caps to do this. It's essentially the identical work to what we just did on the Classic 2, or Classic 1, I mean. So that's why I'm not gonna bother showing it. But what I will do is I will save the first turn on for part three so we can see together if this thing works or not. And I guess at that point, we'll know if there's gonna be a part four where hopefully I can get this Classic fixed. And if I can, then in part four, if this thing doesn't work, we'll have to dig into what's wrong with this. Problem is, we're starting to get into territory of very difficult to fix, and that's because a lot of the logic on these motherboards is all combined into these VLSI chips here. So if you're having problems that exist there that's not just a, a bad trace or something like that, you're kind of up a creek with these. Anyhow, I think that's going to be that. So hopefully you enjoyed this video. I hope people found it helpful about how I go ahead and recap these particular machines. I wanted to show that with the power supply especially, I really don't recommend a blanket recap of every single thing on there. There were a lot of caps we didn't touch. Just focus on the ones that are the bad ones. And it's always those brown ones that are the problem. So deal with those on your classic. Even if you haven't before, I'd recommend you do it because it's probably going to leak eventually. And then in combination with the recapped motherboard, you should have a nice, long-lived, hopefully, hopefully reliable Macintosh machine. So if you're in the market for one of these machines, you best just avoid these things. Really, just, just avoid them. Get a Macintosh SE or a Mac Plus or something like that. The SE30, unfortunately, has really bad capacitor plague on the motherboard as well, so it's going to need help. At least the rest of the Macintosh SE30s are reliable. It's just you got a double whammy with these things, which is why I'm like, yeah, just steer clear. Anyhow, hopefully you enjoyed this. If you did, thumbs up, all that usual YouTube junk. Thanks to my patrons. Their names are scrolling beside the screen. They get early access to videos, all that stuff. There's a link in the description below. If you, to the description below. If you want to become a patron, I think that's going to be that. So stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.